Okay, uh, well, welcome everyone. Uh, uh, our next speaker is uh, Santosh Vampala. Santosh is a distinguished professor at uh, College of Computing at uh, Georgia Tech. Uh, his research interests are in the theory of algorithms, uh, tools for sampling, learning, optimization, data analysis, high dimensional geometry, random linear algebra, and lately computation for good. He has received uh, numerous uh, distinguished awards. Uh, just reading out some, uh, Guggenheim Fellow, uh, Raytheon Fellow, ACM Fellow. Uh, he has received uh, a collection of paper prizes. Again, reading out some uh, gem of pods uh, and most recently uh, the 2021 Soda, which is I think hot off the press. Uh, so congratulations Santos and uh, thank you for agreeing to give a talk here and floor is all yours. Thank you, thanks for this. Uh invitation and for a nice uh, collection of talks. Um, the topic of my talk is uh, about the problem of computing the volume uh, of a high dimensional object. Um, and it's, it's an old problem. Uh, I, I, I'll, more than half the talk is background about and previous developments about the problem, but I'll try to also uh, talk about a, a, a recent development uh, uh, towards the, the latter half. Uh, this is joint work with uh, two graduate students, two PhD students here uh, at Georgia Tech, uh, Her Jia and Aditi Ladda, and uh, 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 Yin Lee, who's a faculty member at the University of Washington. So here's the problem. Um, we have a, a set in high dimensions. Uh, we'll assume it's uh, compact, so it has volume. And the goal is to estimate its volume to within some relative error. Um, so there's no issue of uh, representing the final answer. Um, and now how is this set given to us? Uh, it's specified by some point in the set, you know, some point in the set, which is a little bit deeper inside set. It's not completely uh, on the boundary. Uh, so, it, it, there's a, so we'll make this precise by saying that the, there's a unit ball around uh, a point, which is fully contained in the set. And in addition, uh, the entire set is contained in a ball of uh, radius some capital R. So this capital R and the point X zero are both specified to us. Uh, there's no bound on capital R. I mean, it could be exponentially large and so on. So it takes log of capital R bits to specify it. Now, in addition, you get to query the set as follow, follows. For any point in space, you can ask, is the point in the set? And you get back a yes or no answer. And that's it. That's really the entire interaction with the set. So it's a very general model uh, for various problems in high dimension. And indeed, uh, uh, just about everything that we know how to do in polynomial time, we can do in this uh, rather weak uh, model of interaction. Okay, so here's a first attempt of trying to compute the volume, you know, uh, by from sort of the definition of volume, let's divide it up into little uh, uh, cubes and then uh, count how many of those cubes uh, intersect the set, um, add, add, multiply them by the volume of each cube. And as we make the cube smaller, this should approximate the, the volume arbitrarily close. Now the difficulty of course, is that in uh, n dimensions, the number of cubes will grow exponentially in n. And, and, and we want uh, to know if this problem is polynomial time tractable. So a second attempt would be, well, uh, rather than trying to divide, let's try to sandwich, meaning this red set is the one whose volume we want. Let's try to enclose it uh, between uh, two or, 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 or um, have a simple set inside and outside uh, that's as tight as possible. Now sets for which we know how to easily compute the volume include ellipsoids. So, and uh, one could ask, you know, let's, let's try to have the largest ellipsoid that's contained inside and the smallest ellipsoid that contains it, just a scaling of the inner one, in fact. And the best such thing is the classical result of John. And it says that there is always an ellipsoid for any convex body that uh, sandwiches to within a factor of n. And the n is tight for a simplex. Um, there's also a different ellipsoid that achieves the same result. And this will be um, uh, relevant for us. And this is the ellipsoid uh, uh, obtained from um, uh, the covariance matrix. Uh, and so the following definition will be useful. We'll say that the distribution is an isotropic position if its mean is zero and its covariance is the identity. And so for a convex body in isotropic position, 
which means that I've transformed the set so that uh, uh, the mean and covariance are zero and identity respectively. Um, there is always a ball of radius slightly larger than one and, uh, and uh, uh, contained inside it and a ball of radius uh, slightly larger than square root n, uh, which is, uh, so, sorry, larger than n, which contains it. So it's exactly the same sandwiching ratio. The ratio of these two numbers is still n, uh, but it's a different ellipsoid than the John ellipsoid. Okay. Now, uh, the John ellipsoid is hard to compute exactly, but we can approximate it. So instead of n, you can get n to the 1.5 in polynomial time. This inertial ellipsoid, uh, we can approximate to any factor we'd like, and we'll see soon. Um, either way, suppose you use the volume of these ellipsoids as your approximation to the volume of the body you're interested in, the factor is still n to the order n, right? Uh, it's, it's a polytime algorithm, but the, the, but the factor went up to n to the order. Previously, it was you know, exponential in n factor and exponential time if you just do divide and conquer. Okay, so uh, unfortunately, uh, in some sense, you cannot do better. This result uh, from the, uh, I guess now uh, uh, 25 years ago uh, of uh, Elikesh and refined by Barani and Furedi says that for any deterministic algorithm, that uses at most n to the a queries to this uh, uh, membership in the set k and computes two numbers a and b so that one is a lower bound on the volume and one is an upper bound. There is some convex body for which the ratio that it can find uh, is, is exponentially large. In fact, it's about n over a log n to the n over two. Now in particular, if uh, it's a polynomial algorithm, then a is some constant. So the best possible approximation you can get in polynomial time is n over log n to the power of n over two. So we're almost matching these simple ellipsoidal approximations. Um, in fact, and, yes. And there's a few, few questions. Um, so I'm going to read them out one by one. First is by Sandeep. Uh, does estimating the volume problem relate to estimating the integral of a function over that volume problem? Oh, yes. Okay, so indeed, uh, volume is the same as integrating the constant function over a set. Uh, 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 say function one, um, uh, and more generally, the problem of integrating uh, functions in space is, is 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 very interesting, and we will uh, come to that. This is just a uh, well, maybe the most well known special case of that. Perfect. And I think uh, next question of Sandeep was similar, saying that so uh, by solving, I think uh, paraphrasing by solving the uh, volume problem, does it also help you solve the computing integral problem? Great, so the methods will be similar, but the integral problem is indeed more general. And I will remark as we go through these algorithms, uh, uh, what needs to be done to make it uh, work for uh, integration and what functions can be integrated, not all of course. Yeah. Perfect, all right, thanks. Thank you. Um, so the other hardness result here is by Dyer and Fries. And that says that even for an explicit polytope, so, so this, this lower bound of uh, uh, bar allocation, bar and Freddy, has to do with uh, constructing sets that might not be very easy to represent in, uh, or have short uh, representations. However, the, 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 the theorem of uh, Dyer and Fries says that even if you give me an explicit polytope, it's sharply hard for, for, for extremely well-structured uh, uh, polytopes uh, to compute the volume. So here is what we have, and this is the summary of the lower bounds. If you, if you give me n to the a or Oracle calls for any a, the lower bound on the approximation is roughly n over log n to the n. If you give me one over epsilon to the n Oracle calls, right, for any epsilon, the lower bound is still one plus epsilon to the n. So uh, even if you give me a simple exponential number of Oracle calls, you still have a lower bound that's exponential in n. And this is indeed tight, actually. We can, uh, 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 with, with Daniel Radish, we have a nearly matching upper bound on. Uh, deterministic algorithm. Now, in this against this backdrop came the, the striking result of Dyer, Fries, and Cannon uh, that says that there is a polynomial time randomized algorithm that estimates the volume of any convex body to within relative error one plus epsilon. You choose the epsilon with probability at least one minus delta. You can choose the delta. And the time is n one over epsilon, the polynomial in n one over epsilon and log of capital R over delta. Remember capital R is the the sandwich side. So it it's really is uh, polynomial in the input and uh, in one over epsilon, 
the dependence on our epsilon turns out to be necessary as well. Um, the log one over delta is standard for randomized algorithms. And so from now on, I will ignore that. That will be the dependence for all algorithms. Okay, so since then, there's been a lot of progress. And uh, just to, I, I won't go through everything in this slide, but all I'm putting up there is the exponent of the, of the uh, complexity of volume computation. And uh, um, the, perhaps the most interesting thing is, is that every improvement uh, came with some quite general techniques and uh, interesting uh, new mathematics. Um, the last line here, we'll, we'll be talking about in more detail, is for a special class of convex bodies called uh, well-rounded convex bodies, uh, which are um, uh, uh, convex bodies with the property that this capital R is order of square root n. So in other words, uh, but, but it doesn't have to be the entire body, most of the body. So more precisely, we say that a body is well-rounded if it contains a unit ball and is contained in a ball, is mostly contained, let's say half of the body is contained in a ball of radius order of square root n. That's, that's what well-rounded means, and we'll see that again. Um, okay, so uh, let's make one more attempt now that we know that randomization is essential. Um, uh, here's the sort of the, the, the simple uh, grade school algorithm. Let's pick random points from some simple set like a ball or a cube large enough that contains your uh, body K. For example, we are already given that a ball of capital, radius, capital R radius contains K. And you compute what fraction of the samples fall in K. Okay, now this times the volume of the outer ball is an estimate of the volume of uh, K and it's uh, correct in expectation. But of course, the problem again is that you need too many samples. Indeed, it's the same sort of reasoning as the lower bounds. The trouble is that for any, any uh, uh, set of, any collection of points, the convex hull, uh, and, in, and, and also for any polytope with not too many facets or not too many vertices, the ratio of the ball containing the polytope to the polytope itself is unfortunately exponentially small. Well, fortunately, unfortunately, it's, ex it's, it's exponentially small doesn't matter what the polytope is. The, just the fact that it has either a small number of vertices or a small number of uh, facets directly implies that it's got to be a very small volume compared to the volume of the ball. So this type of approach of using one simple body to, to get uh, at the volume of others, even with sampling, uh, is, is exponentially off. Okay, so, so here's what uh, Dyer, Fries, and, 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 and Cullen did. Uh, it's kind of, so we, we want to estimate the volume of K, which is sandwiched like this. Let's not try to do it in one shot, like on the previous slide. Let's define a sequence of bodies, a sequence of balls, and from those bodies, so that uh, we will estimate uh, in sequence the, the, the volumes of all of these, and eventually the last one will be the volume of the body we're, we're interested in. So more precisely, um, you start with uh, K0 just being uh, the unit ball. That's the, the innermost one here. K0 is just this, this, this one here. And then K1 will be the convex body K intersected with a slightly larger ball, two to the uh, one over N, so about one plus one over N, and then you know two to the two over N and two to the three over N and so on. When I is large enough, when it's about N times log R, then the ball will contain the entire body. So the last body will just be the convex body K. Okay, now why, the, why this sequence? And there's not too many. There's only N times log R total number of bodies in the sequence because it's growing geometrically, even if slowly. And then the, 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 the algorithm is simply, you know, uh, you start with the volume of the unit ball and multiply by the ratios of all of the volumes along the way. Now, that, that's it. So it's very similar to the, to the simple sampling algorithm, except instead of one shot, we're doing it in, in the sequence. And why the sequence? Well, we have the property that every ratio here is going to be small. Uh, uh, the reason every ratio is going to be small is that we chose the radius of the ball to grow by only one plus one over n. And so then a simple argument shows that the volume cannot be more than twice. So the, the volume grows by only a factor of two because the, the, the ball radius is uh, going up by only uh, about one plus one over n. So the ball volume, of course, goes up by only a factor of two, but even the ball intersected with the convex body goes up by only a factor of two. And then this is great because, you know, we're trying to estimate something, uh, a quantity whose, which is between half and one. 
And so using independent samples uh, to get a one plus epsilon approximation, you only need one over epsilon squared samples. And if you need to do this M times and multiply those ratios, since everything is independent, this requires M over epsilon squared samples in each phase, M times. So it's about M squared over epsilon squared. And since M is linear in N, N log R, the whole thing is N squared log squared R basically. And this star is going to subsume log factors and dependence on epsilon. So this is assuming that we can sample. Now remember the sampling problem is not just from a ball anymore, it's from some convex body. And we want to see how much of those, what fraction of samples fall in a different convex body. So this takes us to the sampling problem, which is very interesting on its own, given a, a, a access to a function proportional to a desired uh, uh, density, uh, can you sample from this density? So you were able to ask so what should the density so I think uh, Santosh, I, I yes. uh, incorrectly potentially uh, typed answer to your question in uh, one of the earlier questions. So uh -huh. when you were explaining that slide of all exponents, uh, yes. those exponents primarily were exponents of N. Yes. But, uh, but what happens to the exponent of epsilon? Does it remain same as one over epsilon square or one yes. over epsilon? Sorry. It, it, the, in all of those algorithms, the, the dependence on epsilon is one over epsilon squared. In, in all the randomized algorithms, yes, the dependence on epsilon is one over epsilon squared. Yes. Thank you. Uh, okay, so this is the sampling problem. And uh, the, the state of the art for sampling is that any log concave density can be sampled in polynomial time. And uh, all you need is access to a function that's, pro you know, the, the, so that's proportional to the density. So you should be able to evaluate that at any point. This has many applications. Uh, besides uh, integration uh, and volume computation. Um, one such application which is relevant to this talk is rounding. Uh, this is the idea of estimate, the question of estimating the covariance matrix, the, the mean and the covariance. And the idea, the algorithm is very simple. Just from the definition of mean and covariance, you sample points and as use the sample mean and sample covariance. That's it, that's the whole algorithm. Uh, and then using the sample covariance, you can estimate the transformation that would make it isotropic, right? The A to the minus one half, if A is your covariance estimate. Now, uh, the question is how accurate is this? Meaning how many samples do you need? And it was shown uh, in 2009 that uh, in fact, uh, linear in the dimension number of samples suffice. Uh, the C epsilon here also grows roughly as one over epsilon squared. Uh, and and with, with a linear in, in N uh, number of samples, the estimate of the covariance is close in, uh, in, 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 uh, in uh, uh, operator norm. So it's actually, uh, a, in other words, for every, vector v, the variance along that direction is estimated to within one relative error one plus epsilon using only constant depending on epsilon times n random samples. Um, so that's another application to figure out this, uh, this uh, ellipsoid that, that, that is the covariance ellipsoid assuming you can sample. Okay, but how do we sample? And it turns out sampling algorithms are among the simplest uh, algorithms, uh, for, at least in this setting. Uh, uh, in the literature. Uh, in the case of uh, this general, general problem with membership oracles, the, the way, uh, one way to do it is, is the ball walk, which is the following. At a point X in the set, you pick a random point from a, from a ball of fixed radius delta around the set. And then uh, if that new point is in the set, you go there. If not, you just try again. That's it, that's the, that's the whole algorithm, right? It's this rejection sampling. You pick a point in the ball, if it's there in the set, you go there, if not, you try again. It's not hard to see that, the, that this process is symmetric and therefore for any connected set, the stationary distribution that it will approach, or, or, or it will be, will be uh, uniform. Now, the fact that it does approach a stationary distribution and it approaches it quickly is something that takes much more work and uh, we'll, uh, we'll get to that. There are other walks, uh, just one of them called hit and run is quite successful in this general setting. There are many other walks for specialized things like polytopes that I won't get into in the talk. Now, the main question, as I mentioned, is how do we, how many steps of this process do we need? Each step of the ball walk is a one membership query. So it's the number of steps determines the complexity of, 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 of sampling. And for this, um, the, the, the technique is, 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 is bound in the conductance of this underlying Markov chain, which comes down to two uh, geometric uh, properties. One is about what happens in one step. You know, what happens to two the distribution of one step taken from these, from these points. 
and the other is uh, is 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 uh, more geometric in general. It's uh, isoperimetry, and it's the uh, question of what is the smallest possible boundary that a subset of a given measure can have. So I'll talk more about this, but this is the form of the of the type of isoperimetry inequality. Uh, well, this one is a true inequality, but uh, 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 one of the earlier ones, and uh, we'll we'll see how how this has been refined more recently. What does this say? This is saying suppose I take some partition of your set, let's say in this case, the convex body uh, K here into two sub, three subsets, S1, S2, and S3. S1 and S2 are disjoint here as marked here, S1 and S2 are disjoint. And not only are they disjoint, they are uh, at minimum distance D S1, S2. This means the minimum distance between any two points in S1 and S2. Then you're asking what's the leftover volume? What's the minimum possible remaining volume? So it scales linearly in the distance, that's maybe uh, intuitive. And with the smaller of these two, that's perhaps also intuitive. Um, but then the factor in front just depends on an absolute constant and the diameter of the set. This capital R is effectively the diameter of the set. So the distance between the sets divided by the diameter of the set times the smaller of the sets. This has to be the case for the minimum volume. Now a set for which this would not be true would be something shaped like this, right? Where the, the, the prob you need a very little cut, small cut to separate these two. And the whole point is that convex bodies of log concave densities, which I haven't defined yet, cannot have this kind of shape. Okay, so this isoperimetry turns out to be crucial. And, and the, formally, it's exactly what we uh, alluded to in the previous slide. For any subset S, doesn't have to be continuous, just a measurable subset like this. Um, the, the, the isoperimetric ratio is the volume of the set to the boundary, into, to its internal boundary, over all subsets of, of size no more than half. And so it's the maximum possible ratio of this. Now, the, the, the reason this uh, comes up is that it directly bounds the mixing time of the ball walk, as shown by Kanan, Lovas, and Shimonov in 97. In dimension n, the mixing time is n squared times this this isoperimetric ratio square. So the smaller the isoperimetric ratio, the faster is the ball walk. And then it becomes a good question, natural question, what is the best possible bound on this isoperimetric uh, constant, sometimes called the Kalis constant? Um, to uh, one way to, one nice way to, to think about this constant and the bounds that have been proven about it is via, via the covariance matrix. So which is just, which I've stated here again. Um, the trace of the covariance matrix is the expected square distance of a random point from, from, the, from the mean. Um, and uh, uh, here is what uh, Kanan, Lovat, and Shimonov has proved about this. They've showed that this uh, uh, isoperimetric ratio, or this constant, is at most uh, an absolute constant times the square root of the trace. And in particular, if the body is isotropic, meaning the covariance is identity, then the trace is n, and so this is order of square root n. As a result, you get a mixing time of n cubed, which is what they proved. Okay. Now they conjectured though, that it only depends on the largest eigenvalue. This is the KLS conjecture, that it depends only on the largest eigenvalue, in which case, uh, uh, you know, the largest eigenvalue in the isotropic case, which means all eigenvalues are one, is order one, and the mixing time is n squared, would be n squared. Um, in a, a few years ago, uh, uh, we refined their bound to show that it's in fact the fourth root of the sum of squares of the eigenvalues. So somewhere in between the two, the conjecture and the theorem, this means n to the one fourth and gives it into 2.5. A few months ago, uh, Yan Su Chen proved that for, uh, that in fact the bound can be improved to um, a sub polynomial factor times uh, uh, the square root of the largest eigenvalue. Um, so up to a sub polynomial factor, the conjecture is true. And this gives on the mixing time a bound of n to the two plus little o one. Okay, so uh, what is the conjecture? The conjecture says that there is no factor there. It's actually just square root of uh, uh, lambda one. And uh, it's very natural because another way to interpret it is that the worst cut, the cut whose area is smallest compared to the volume of the subset is always uh, a half space cut up to a constant factor. So we're saying that half space cuts, just you know, straight uh, hyperplane cuts must be uh, the minimum, the worst possible up to some universal constant factor. 
that's the conjecture. So it's it's it's, it's really clean. And 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 in this in this uh, strong version, it's still open because there's we have a dependence on the dimension. Okay, so that's the theorem, and I mentioned already this. Now the second line is important uh, because while sampling is directly related to this isotropic constant, volume turns out to be considerably more difficult, and in particular. You know, we'll have to deal with uh, uh, non-isotropic bodies in the course of the volume algorithm, and there, uh, the bound where we have n squared times the trace of the covariance, which is the the, the bound from Kahn and Lovaz and Shimonovic, will be will be important, and that that gives n q. Just remind you. Okay, so this completes the analysis of the KLS volume algorithm, which is you know n phases, n samples per phase, and n cube queries per uh, sample giving you n to the five. So this was the status as of 1997. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's the now. How do we go beyond this? Seems quite tight, right? N phases, n samples per phase, and q. In fact, you could say you must take n phases because the volume of your initial body and your final body could be will be in general be off by an exponential factor. And so you know how could you decrease by have fewer than fewer than n, n phases. So here's where we go to a more general setting. Rather than a sequence of bodies, let's think about a sequence of functions where uh, our goal is to integrate the last function in the sequence. And the first function in the sequence is something simple, like the constant function over a unit ball or a Gaussian, something like this. And again, we use the same telescoping sequence as the, as the uh, algorithm and estimate each ratio. Now, how do you estimate the ratio of two integrals? Well, we sample a point with density proportional to the to the function in the denominator, and then our estimator is just the ratio of the densities. So it's the classical statistical method, the ratio of the densities at that point, and its expectation is exactly the ratio of the integrals. Okay, so so uh, you you sample a point and you look at the ratio of the densities, and 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 you sample according to the function in the denominator, and what you get back is the expect in expectation is the ratio of the integrals. So now the question is. Uh, uh, you know, what function should we use and uh, how, how long will this take? So let's use a function which uh, uh, it looks like this, uh, an exponential in, the, in, the, in, in some norm of the, of the current point. And uh, it has a coefficient ai, which in statistical physics would be an inverse temperature. And uh, it, it, uh, uh, this coefficient starts out very high. So the function is extremely narrow and concentrated, right? It, it looks like some something like that. Uh, it, it may be almost entirely concentrated in the ball that we know is contained in the body. And at the end, it's something very close to zero. So the, so the function is almost uniform, okay? If you wanted to sample some other function f, log on gave density, you would stop uh, at the point where this was close to f. So, and, and notice here, the important change that we are going to change this parameter, this coefficient at a rate of one plus one over root n. Not one plus one over n, you know, the two to the one over n, but one plus one over root n, and that means that the number of phases will only be root n times the log factor, and uh, this is still okay. And the, the reason is that even though you're going only root n phases, the variance of this estimator turns out to be a uh, 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 constant. I mean, the, this Chebyshev ratio, the variance, is at most a constant times the square of the expectation. So you still need only one over epsilon squared samples in each phase and m over epsilon squared samples for uh, if you're doing m phases. Okay, so uh, this is the is, is the algorithm we had in uh, 2003, uh, which uh, basically used root n phases, root n samples per phase, and still the n cube samples per uh, queries per sample, giving n to the four. So if you notice here, the total number of samples we're producing in the entire algorithm is only about n. Okay, and, and that. Uh, appears to be optimal. Um, so now there's an important component that I haven't talked about here in both of these, which is that these algorithms assume that the body that you start with is nearly isotropic, meaning its covariance is almost identity. So there's a question here, how do we round? How do we make the, the, the body uh, uh, nearly isotropic? And the algorithm is going to be quite simple. We'll use a sequence of balls and now we can go, we'll, we'll go faster. We'll double the radius of the ball at each step. And to, to make the next body isotropic, we will sample from the, you know, from, from the next body. And, uh, and uh, 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 
estimate its uh, its uh, its covariance matrix, thereby using the estimate of the covariance, we can make it nearly isotropic and we repeat this. Um, why is it that you can sample from the next body when you jump so much? And this is an important lemma. This is in, 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 the, in, in the paper with Lovas. It is that if uh, uh, the current body Ki is isotropic, then Ki plus one, which is obtained by taking K intersect a ball of twice the radius is well-rounded, meaning the trace of the covariance, right? of Ki plus one is order n. That's what we mean by well-rounded. That's what the expectation of x squared is, right? Okay, um, so, so we can't maintain isotropy all through, but given isotropic, the next one is well-rounded. We sample that, make it isotropic. So you, you, you do this, uh, this, 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 this type of sequence. Isotropic, the next one is well-rounded, make it isotropic, then the next one is well-rounded and you do this. And since we're doubling, we only need a log number of phases. And, but in each phase, you need N samples, each of which costs N cube. Therefore we take N to the four, which is the same as the volume complexity. So the overall complexity is N to the four. Okay, now how can we go into this? Part? Yes. So there's a question uh, from okay. Jonathan. Uh, the question reads, this reminds me a lot uh, of the ideas of nested sampling used in stats and thermodynamics. Uh, can you please comment? Yes, uh, um, using sequences of distributions for, uh, for, uh, for, for sampling harder distributions or for optimization is, is a, you know, the simulated annealing or, simul or, or cooling type of ideas are indeed, uh, 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 are, uh, have been used multiple times. And uh, this is similar to that. The, the, the analysis is perhaps the, 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 the novel aspect here where we have to be careful about uh, the variance of the estimators. Um, this and lemma, this particular, yes, sorry. No, no please, let, I'll let you finish. Yeah, this particular lemma about isotropy implying well-roundedness is, 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 is a bit delicate because um, uh, it is not true that if Ki is isotropic, then Ki plus one is also nearly isotropic. That's not true. So even if, if you scale up your, ball by a factor of two, the next body could be way off from isotropic. However, it remains well-rounded and, 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 and this we can leverage. Uh, but since it's only well-rounded, sampling is more expensive. Uh, and ne nevertheless, we can still keep everything under n to the four. Yes. David's question is, how do you make well-rounded body isotropic? Oh, that's, uh, you can make any body isotropic if you can sample it, right? Any convex body, that, that's, the, that's the, just by using, uh, order n samples to estimate its covariance. So to use order n samples, to estimate the covariance. And once you have the covariance, take the square root and there's your uh, isotropic transformation. Um, the, the, that's for anybody. But the point is that uh, the sampling for well-rounded bodies takes n cube because you can always, because the trace is small. It's n squared times the trace. Uh, whereas for arbitrary bodies, it could take a really long time. Okay, so here we are. So now the next improvement came in a, with, a, with a Ben Cuddle, who was a PhD student uh, at the time. Um, uh, and there, very simple change. Let's we use the same algorithm, but let's uh, use a sequence of Gaussians restricted to the body rather than some log concave function or exponentially decaying. Let's use a sequence of Gaussians. Same algorithm. Why Gaussian? The reason why Gaussian is that the careless conjecture already holds for Gaussian convex bodies. This is a, it's not hard to prove. Um, we included a proof in the paper. So in fact, it's, it's the dependence, uh, the isoperimetry it just depends on the largest eigenvalue, which in this Gaussian setting will turn out to be just one over the standard deviation of the, of the uh, Gaussian that you're using. So as a result, if you're, if you're using, if you're trying to sample a Gaussian of variance sigma squared restricted to convex body, which contains the unit ball, the, 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 the time it takes you will be uh, n squared times the smaller, you know, it's n squared times sigma squared or n squared if sigma squared is less than one, okay? So it only increases, of course, as sigma squared becomes uh, very large, then you expect it to be, start hitting n cubed because, you know, it's all, it starts getting to almost uniform. But, but when sigma squared is small, you actually do gain, okay? So that's the algorithm. We're still going up by one plus one over root n. How are we going to gain? So, so the point is that when sigma squared is small, now the sampling time is only n squared. 
okay? And so this part is NQ. But when sigma squared is large, we're gonna actually go faster. Rather than one plus one over root n, we'll go by one plus whatever is the current sigma over root n. So it, it, you know, it accelerates. And this accelerated schedule still maintains this property that the variance of the estimator is small. And now let's see what happens. The sampling time is going up, right? It's sigma squared n squared. But the number of phases you need to double is only root n over sigma. Because you're already at sigma, you want to double it, you need root n over sigma phases since, since each time you're doing one plus sigma over root n. Okay, good. And so the number of phases times number of samples per phase times sampling time, your sigma squares all cancel out and you end up with n cubed. So the volume algorithm here is n cubed, assuming that the convex body is well-rounded. So for a well-rounded body, you get n cubed uh, volume. That was the theorem then. But then still the question, if I start with an arbitrary body, how do I uh, make sure it's well-rounded or, uh, right, uh, or isotropic? And uh, this is uh, what has been an open question all along. And the main new result here, I have a few minutes, is that any convex body uh, uh, can be brought into a near isotropic position using n cubed times size squared membership queries. Okay, uh, size the KLS constant. Now the volume of convex body can be computed therefore as a corollary because once it's in, in near isotropic or well-rounded, we know it can be done in n cubed. So, uh, so this is the bottleneck. And, and so therefore the volume of arbitrary convex body is n cubed size squared. And in fact, uh, the, 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 with the current bound on psi, this is n to the three plus little o one. Then it'll become n cubed if somebody proves the KLS index. That's the main result. Um, I can, uh, I, I, I will describe the algorithm and briefly at least and some of the analysis, but please uh, feel free to interrupt at this point. So think, um, um, yeah. this is, there are no questions in chat that are unanswered, but uh, if folks have questions, please feel free to ask or we can let Santosh continue. Great. Okay, right. so yeah. uh, here's the algorithm. To, to, so the goal now is how do you round a body? Meaning I have a body that could be an arbitrarily skewed and I want to make it isotropic, meaning I want to make its covariance uh, identity or close to that. Um, so the outer loop will be the same as in the, in the, in the algorithm uh, uh, with, with low S, where we have these phases where we're doubling the ball and we're just, every time we double, we make it uh, isotropic. Double, make it isotropic. Now, that, that, that part is exactly the same. But previously, to, to turn a well-rounded body into an isotropic body, we were taking uh, an, 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 uh, an, an cube step. I'm sorry, uh, n to the four. We were taking n to the four because each sample, you no, know, we need n samples. Sorry, just to remind you, n samples. And each sample was taking n squared times the trace of the current covariance, which is n cubed. So the total was n to the four, okay? So uh, the number of phases is not a problem, it's only log. The problem is that turning well-rounded to isotropic is the bottleneck. Okay, so how are we gonna do that? The way we'll do that is, that is the following. I'm going to state the algorithm here and then we'll discuss it in detail. So the naive way to do it is to use n samples each time, right? Rather, we won't use n samples. So when we start out with well-rounded, we have a ball of radius one. We're going to use a very few samples, just O tilde R squared. So about R squared times poly log n. And here's the algorithm. We'll sample K points, estimate the covariance. So it'll be a very crude estimate. But using this estimate, according to this estimate, we'll figure out what are the uh, 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 large eigenvalues and the small eigenvalues, just based on a threshold. And all the, the subspace of small eigenvalues will scale up, okay? So, uh, and, and then the subspace of large eigenvalues will leave as it is. And then we just repeat this. Okay, uh, let, let, here's the algorithm again. We sample K points from the current body, estimate the covariance. Look at the subspace with large eigenvalues, and scale up everything orthogonal to it by a factor of two, okay? Uh, uh, as I mentioned already, the naive algorithm would be to estimate the covariance fully, but the, the, the problem is that it takes too many samples, it takes n samples, so you'll be back at n, n to the four. So what we'll do instead, is what we're doing is using coarse estimates and getting better and better with not too many rounds. So initially, with, with, with a few samples, we'll only, we'll only be able to estimate the very large eigenvalues, you know, the directions where the body is extremely long, uh, and then 
will get better and better and better. Okay, why is this better? Well, the reason is this. As we make it more isotropic, sampling will be faster. You can't see this from the trace alone. So we'll need a more refined analysis of the sampling itself for well-rounded bodies, we'll, we'll get there. But the point is going to be roughly this. Uh, there were two previous ways to look at sampling, either based on the largest eigenvalue, which is the isotropic case. So it's as long as all eigenvalues are small, great. Or the trace, which is the sum of all eigenvalues. And if all sum of the sum is small, then you get a different bound, which is off by a factor of n, but still it holds. What we're gonna talk about here is let's look at the distribution of eigenvalues. And as long as you have uh, uh, um, more and more you know, the uh, spread of the, of the eigenvalues, you'll get faster and faster sampling. That's going to be the, the message. So here, here is, the, here is the, in more detail. So we want to find the large directions using a few samples and then scale up the complementary subspace, right? That's the, the point. If you find the large directions and everything orthogonal to it will scale up um, and repeat this with more samples. This threshold for what's big will keep the same. We're scaling up so the inner ball is growing. Okay, it doesn't matter as long as everything is growing, but the point is the inner ball is growing, the largest directions are not growing. So this ratio is getting better. Um, now, so this, this, uh, the, 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 the sampling complexity, the, the one we already know, is, is, uh, is depends on the, the, the trace divided by the radius of the ball squared. And the radius is one, this disappears, but otherwise it's the trace divided by the radius squared. That's the KLS bound. But in fact, you can control it much better. And the theorem is that if the KLS constant is n to the one over p for some p bigger than one, then for any density q with covariance a, the, the KLS constant is in fact the, this, this pth norm of the square root of the pth norm of the eigenvalues. This, this ap is just uh, uh, summation or to the power of p is summation of lambda i of a to the p. That's all this is. Okay, so uh, 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 when, when, when p is one, that's the trace, but we're saying that if the KLS constant is, is better, you get, you get better and better bounds here. Okay, so if this is true, since, the, since we know that in general, the sampling time is n squared times size squared, we get a bound that grows with this norm rather than with the trace. And this norm, it will be easier to control as we go along. Okay, or will be will have a better bound when we can control. So here's the plan for the for the, the, the just an outline of the properties. I, I won't have time to prove these things, but um, the trace, you know, uh, is just going to be whatever is the inner ball times the original trace. Just because we're we're, we're growing the inner ball. Okay, this norm will grow very mildly. It'll only grow as the radius of the inner ball to the power of two over p, rather than, so you see the trace, there's no p, it's n times r squared, but with, the, with, the, with this norm, it is, there's an r to the two over p, you know, because you're, you're powering up the large eigenvalues, those are not growing. It's only the small ones that you're increasing each time, and we're taking advantage of that in, in this bound. Now, in addition, because you're scaling up, something geometric happens, which is that um, the radius of the largest ball inside is going to almost double each time. It's going to almost double. Um, the last thing is that in order to estimate these large eigenvalues, I need to show you that not too many samples are required, and that will be a, an application of matrix Chernoff bounds. Putting all these together, we get that the, 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 the number of samples, this is again the number of samples. This is the complexity of sampling, n squared times this, this, this new bound here, and that's n cube rj to the two over p. And since rj to the one over p is the, is the, is the psi, we, we get here n cube psi squared. So the bound is n cube psi squared. Okay, so uh, these were outlines of the lemma proofs, but, uh, but I don't think I'll have time for that. Um, this is the lemma. The, the, the first one was the lemma that, um, that the trace, uh, and this, this norm doesn't grow much, this pth norm of the eigenvalues. And uh, the second bound is that the radio, the second lemma is that the, 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 the ball inside grows almost doubles each time. Um, this is also an elementary proof. And the last lemma uh, is that the, uh, if you use K samples, this is a very general uh, uh, matrix Chernoff bound, that to estimate the covariance, if I only use K samples, then the estimate I'm going to get will be off from the right answer by epsilon A plus 
uh, polylog factor times the trace of A divided by epsilon K. So you see, uh, and in particular, if I set K to be trace of A, you know, basically polylog, then it's off by a, a fixed uh, additive term. And therefore, you know, in particular, if I use this K value, I can detect eigenvalues larger than say constant times N. And that, that, that's going to be the targeting algorithm. Okay, so this, this last slide, uh, technical slide was going to be about um, uh, uh, how we, you know, the, the isoperimetry itself, and we needed this additional refinement, which doesn't follow from just the KLS bound. Um, and it's, 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 in, it's the following that if, you know, in our paper, improving the KLS bound, we, we showed in fact that the KLS constant is bounded by the Frobenius norm to the one half, which is the summation of the lambda i squares to the one half. Okay, and so the question is, how can this hold more generally? And indeed it does. So if you could prove a better bound on the KLS constant for isotropic bodies, it implies a better bound on the KLS constant in terms of the P norm, right? This, this is this one over two beta for all log concave densities. Okay, so uh, 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 this is the, the conclusion. The complexity is therefore n cube science squared using uh, Chen's uh, uh, exciting bound of uh, uh, subpolynomial, we get that the complexity of rounding volume just as a corollary is now n to the three plus little o one. Um, I'll, I'll stop here with a couple of uh, quick questions, open questions uh, for you, which is, um, um, it continues to be very interesting to determine how true is the KLS conjecture. You know, it may not affect the volume complexity so much at this point, but uh, chances are that any improvements will give us some uh, very nice techniques and understanding. Um, finally, here's a problem that uh, we know much less about. Um, can we estimate the volume of an explicit polytope in deterministic polynomial time? So let's say I want a factor two estimate of the volume of an explicit polytope with integer coefficients and all of that. It's sharply hard, but I just want a factor two estimate. And so even for this problem, the best known algorithms uh, proceed with sampling and, and, and use a lot of randomness. And so the question is, can we do better? Thank you. Thank you, Santosh. Um, uh, there are, while people sort of uh, type their questions in the chat uh, on the last slide, uh, maybe I'll ask you a question and get it started. Uh, so here, AX less than or equal to B and the volume, uh, one um, way to think about uh, the volume in this case is uh, related to, uh, let's say, the partition function for a graphical model that one may de define by thinking of the constraints as effectively the, uh, the factors of the graphical model. And uh, that means that if the structure of the graphical model that is induced by the, uh, the constraint graph that is there, then, and if it's not too bad, for example, tree, then uh, of course we know how to compute partition function. There are other graphs for which also we know how to compute partition function, but definitely that's not something, uh, uh, I mean, I'm trying to sort of understand from your, your perspective, how would sort of that perspective help here, if any? Right, I mean, that is, that is kind of using, um, you know, very nice structure in those models to come up with these uh, deterministic uh, 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 sampling or counting algorithms. Mm -hmm. um, uh, right, so the question is whether, you know, one really needs that, you know, uh, of course one could say, you know, uh, P might equal RP. I mean, maybe randomness mm -hmm. is not necessary. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we have Markov chain algorithms in the explicit case, but maybe there is a pseudo random generator. And so everything is, sure. can be done deterministically. But I guess that, that that's sort of a much higher uh, or, or, or more abstract goal. Here, the question is, is there some algorithm that specializes to a polytope? So for, mm -hmm. for, the, for the convex body membership oracle setting, we have lower bounds, mm -hmm. right? So you, you really do need an exponential number of queries for deterministic algorithms. But here it's polytope. So we have to somehow take advantage of the polytopes, just the fact that it's a polytope with not too many, you know, with a polynomial number of facets, inequalities. And uh, so that's saying like, what kind of algorithm could you possibly do? So for example, <laughs> you know, here's something from um, chaos theory that, that, uh, that people mm -hmm. have done, but not necessarily in this setting, which is that you, you pick a direct, you pick, start at some point, pick a direction, 
and you use the positive boundaries to bounce off, you know, like a billiards uh, sequence. You just keep going. And then uh, after some time, which again, you can do nothing randomly. Everything has to be deterministic. Uh, you, 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 wherever you are, you, t- you, you look at the entire trace of where you've traveled and you treat that, uh, that uh, sequence of points you visited as a sample. Mm-hmm. Okay. And uh, under some nice conditions, uh, one can show that um, for almost any starting point and almost any starting direction, this set of points that you will encounter will be close to uniform in the sense that for any partition of the body, you will get the right distribution. Right. But this is sort of the foundations of chaos. But okay, turning that into algorithms, I mean, that looks like a lot of uh, <laughs> interesting <laughs> stuff to be done. Yeah. But, but no, I, I don't know if, the, if, the, if, if some of these, um, you know, uh, spatial uh, decay results can be used uh, here or generalized, that would be very nice. All right, uh, now we've got a question in chat uh, from Siddharth. Is the N-cube bound a natural barrier? Okay, that's it for, for volume computation. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, um, for uh, uh, N, yeah, uh, I, I only have heuristic arguments for that. Uh, uh, we don't have a candidate lower bound construction. Uh, whereas for volume, N squared is uh, likely a lower bound uh, 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 n squared, but not n cube is not clear um, at all. Um, what we do know is that all the sampling processes in this generality, um, the ones, any, all of the ones we know, have an n squared lower bound. You know, the ball walk, hit and run, th- these variations all need n squared even to go from one end of the body to another end, another part. But um, whether n cube is a lower bound volume, it'd be great to have some family of bodies and this defined distribution over them to show that any algorithm must make at least n cube queries. You know, this doesn't require any kind of P and P separation, right? This is just a, an Oracle model. So you could have an explicit lower bound using an explicit family of, distri- of convex bodies to show that uh, n cube is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a lower bound, it's possible. But it's just um, I would guess question. That, say again. Uh, sorry to interrupt, Santosh. Uh, no, no, no. I'll, I'll let you finish. No, no, that, that, that's really all I was saying. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, uh, as you were speaking, a, a natural question arises, and I'm pretty sure um, folks have already thought about it. So, uh, uh, is there an, uh, a statistical or information theoretic view for uh, maybe number of queries one needs? For example, each query provides you some number of bit of information and the number of different combinatorial options or is are at least these many in the space of uh, different convex bodies. And that means yeah, so that so you need at least. Right, good, yeah. I mean, this is the type of lower bounds people have proven in, in you know, restricted models of computation for various things, right? So, yeah. um, um, so you know, you can imagine that uh, you, you look at the, suppose I, I, I define my uh, set of convex bodies somehow. So let's say yeah. all possible uh, rotations of a of a cube, or of a of or, or either it's a cube or it's a long long object, mm-hmm. and it's 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 a random rotation of these, and you just need to determine which one of those two it is, right? Okay. And so how many queries do you need? And so you you look at the algorithm as starting out with this full distribution of possibilities, mm-hmm. and when it stops, it stops where the 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 conditional distribution must have the volume concentrated, like the probability yeah. that the volume is one or the other is, mu- is much more mm-hmm. than half. Say. Mm-hmm. And so now you want to say that at each step, the distribution at any level is still quite distributed among the, the, the possibilities. So uh, yeah, uh, it, it's just a abstract proof possibility, not a, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, well, looks like we are, at the time and uh, no more questions in chat. So uh, let me clap for everyone and <laughs> everybody can give reactions. Thank you for a lovely talk, Santosh. Thank you.